to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ there was a man sent from god whose name was john john chapter 1 verse number 6. We welcome you today to our study of great Bible characters. In this series of lessons, we've been looking at both Old and New Testament today as well, characters who stand out as men of God and characters in the Bible who are ones we can follow as we strive to live for Christ and ultimately glorify God and make it to that wonderful place called heaven. We welcome you today to our study of this book or of this series. And if you're joining us for the first time, maybe we're so glad that you've joined our broadcast. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, they're available free of charge on our website, thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to have it in DVD form, you can also fill out a media request form from our website and we'd be glad to get that to you as well. This program is being brought to you by members of the Churches of Christ. Those members in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit the Church of Christ. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to study the Word of God more and, and know more about the Lord's Church, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Bible with you and at the Gospel of Christ. If we can help you in your Bible study in any way, Please email us or let us know. Call us, write to us. We'd be glad to help you in any way in your search to know more about the Word and the will of God. What do we know about John the Baptist or John the Immerser? He is a unique figure who stands out in the Bible as one of the great heroes who prepared the way for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's just some basic information about John himself and a little bit of biographical information about his life. John's name, which means God is gracious, was given divinely to John's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, by God himself. Luke chapter 1, verse number 13. He is known as the baptizer or the immerser, one who baptizes. This is not really a title, but it's more a description of the work that John the immerser did. He was spoken by this, uh, called this in Matthew 3, 1 and Matthew 11, 11 by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, Josephus in his Antiquities of the Jewish History even writes about John and refers to him as the baptizer. Now, when we think about the why of that, you can remember all the regions of Jerusalem, Judea, and the regions thereabout, they went out to be baptized by John. Matthew chapter 3, verse 5 following. And so the great work John did was getting people ready for the kingdom of God. You know, one of the great compliments that probably the greatest compliment John ever received was given by our Lord and Savior. In Matthew 11 and verse 11, Jesus said of those born of women, none is greater than John the Baptist. John played second fiddle. He prepared the way for Jesus. He, he wasn't wanting the limelight. He wasn't even looking for the spotlight. He wanted to help people get their heart ready so that when the Messiah came, they would be ready for his message. Luke chapter 1 verse 5 records of John's background that he was actually born to a priestly family. His father, Zacharias, was going to be going to his uh, priestly duties when he received that message that they were going to have a son whose name was going to be John as well. And so as we think about John, he has a great and rich history, but he also has a very unique connection to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, he was the cousin of Jesus. The Bible records in Luke chapter 1, verse number 36, that Elizabeth and Mary 
were kin. Your close kin, Mary, is going to give birth. And so we have that indication that John and Jesus were also kin. And so connected to the Savior in that way as well. In fact, Luke 1 verse 36 records that Jesus was three months younger than John the Immerser. John was six months older than Jesus. And so directly related in time, directly connected there. And what's unique about John is that from his birth, John was a Nazarite. You study back to the book of Numbers and you look at the Nazarites. They weren't to cut their hair. They weren't to drink strong drink. They, they were to be separated for a special and unique purpose. And my friends, John the Immerser, surely, John the Baptist, surely fulfills that role in that he was a rather rugged and rough individual, but he did a work that God sent him to do. What was that work? He was not the Messiah, even though some thought He was. Luke chapter 3, verse 15, His work rather was to prepare people for the Messiah. Now, as we mention about John, one of the things that stands out as really unique is his nature. John wasn't like a lot of people. He was a rather rough and rugged type of individual. Matthew 3, verse 4, we learn of John that he was dressed in camel hair, that he ate locusts and honey, that he spent a great deal of time in the wilderness. And so he wasn't your typical everyday person. He was a little different. Maybe walked to the beat of a little different drum in the sense that he was more of a rugged and rough and type of nature of an individual. But you know, as you think about John, John may have even rather been reclusive in some ways concerning his nature. Maybe more of an introvert rather than an extrovert. Matthew 11 verse 18, they said of, of Jesus, he came eating and drinking, but John didn't come eating and drinking. The idea of eating and drinking during that time frame meant socializing. And so John wasn't maybe the social type, although Jesus went to the masses, the masses actually would end up coming to John to hear him preach the gospel. But here's what we know about John. One of the things that stands out as so unique and amazing about John was his phenomenal influence for Jesus Christ. Matthew 3 verse 5, all the regions of Jerusalem, Judea, went out to be baptized by John. Uh, John 1 verse 28, John 3 verse 23, uh, he was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. And in all of those occasions, you've got hordes of people coming out to be baptized by John. Of course, his message was, repent, the kingdom is at hand. But look at the mass influence he had. It, he simply preached the word of God, did what God told him to, and that word had the power to change people's hearts. You know, another unique thing about John, and, and this really speaks to how a lot of people have some misconceptions today about the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, the Bible says that John had the Holy Spirit without measure. That is, that he was full of the Holy Spirit. And naturally, when people think about the Holy Spirit today, they want to tie that in with miraculous and speaking in tongues and the uh, sign that you've got the Holy Spirit is that you can do some type of miraculous. John teaches us that's not true. For in John 10 verse 41, the scripture says of John, John performed no sign. Now think about this. Had the Holy Spirit without measure and never did a miracle. What do I learn from that? I must not naturally think Holy Spirit miracle. That's not always the case. The Word of God dwells in men and women today and they also can have the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. And John is a prime example that all too often our minds are quick to run to the miraculous when we think Holy Spirit, but that may not necessarily be the case. Well, let's think just a moment then about some of the prophecies we have concerning John. I want to direct your attention to a prophecy in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40. And I want you to notice what Isaiah says about John and the work that he would do. Written 750 years before John comes on the scene, Isaiah 40 verse 3 records this. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. What was John? John was simply a voice proclaiming the way. 
John would say, I am not He. There's one coming after me whose sandal strap I'm not even worthy to loose. He, I baptize you with water. He'll baptize you with fire. He, he preached to the people, repent for the kingdom is at hand. To those who wanted to do it for outward show, John would say, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee? From the wrath to come. Was he a, a fiery and intense and bold and straightforward proclaimer? Sure he was. A friend, he proclaimed the way of God in truth and sincerity. He prepared the way for Christ. He was to prepare the way to make his path straight. You know, in any kind of work, you've got to have preparation. You maybe even need somebody to go ahead of you and to get things ready. To make sure that when that work is ready, you're ready for it to happen as well. That was John's job. He got the people's hearts softened. He broke that outward shell that we often think of. And now that their hearts are tender, they're thinking about God and spiritual things and where they need to be. Jesus comes on the scene. The path is straight. The Messiah can come in and now teach the will of of God. Now, a second Old Testament passage that speaks about John is found in the book of Malachi, and I direct your attention to that minor prophet Malachi as he speaks about the Messiah and, of course, his forerunner, John the Immerser. You notice Malachi chapter 3. Here's what the scripture says in verse number 1 God said, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. What was John's work again? To be a messenger. He had a message from God. He faithfully proclaimed that message and he was to prepare the way for the Messiah. Now, in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it is prophesied that one was going to come in the spirit of Elijah or Elijah was coming. Who was that? According to Luke 1 verse 16 and Matthew 11 verses 12 through 15, that was John the Immerser. And so that same spirit, that same heart, that same prophesying what God wanted him to say, preaching what God wanted him to say, is exactly what John came to do. Now, we know that John came with a message. Let's take just a moment and let's think about the powerful message John brought and how that prepared the people for the Savior. What was his message? John pointed people to the Lamb of God. Notice John 1 verse 29. John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John sees Jesus approaching and, and he cries out to the people. That voice crying in the wilderness cries out, This is the Lamb of God. And so he wasn't trying to live in the limelight. He wanted people to know Jesus was the Messiah. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes were healed. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 3 and 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21 says that he was uh, foreordained before the foundation of the world, the Lamb without spot and blemish, manifest in these last times for us. And so he pointed people to the Lamb of God. What else did John do? John 1, verse 34, John pointed people to Jesus as the Son of God. Not only did he say, here's the Lamb of God, he identified Christ as the Son of God, deity, God in the flesh as well. And then when I think about John, John had a real message of change. Here's that message. Matthew chapter 3, verse number 2. John said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What was his message all about? Changing their hearts. Getting right with God. You know, the Jews over history and through time had, had that outward show of repentance, but really getting to the heart of the matter was always the challenge. Yes, they might sit around the ash pile and throw dust and ashes on their heads. They might pull the hair out of their beard or out of their head and, and they might have a great outward sign of repentance. That's not what God's looking for. Joel 2 verse 13, God said, rend your hearts, not your garments. That's what John wanted to do. Get people to change their hearts. But you know, along with that repentance, there was a message motivating them to do that. Matthew 3, verse 7, John said of Jesus, His hand, His winnowing, His hand would be in the winnowing, His winnowing fan would be in His hand, and He would separate, as it were, the wheat from the chaff. He would bring judgment 
on those who did not follow the teaching and the principles of Almighty God. And so we see the great work that John did. Now, let's take just a few moments and let's make some practical application from the life and example of John that will help us to live more faithfully to Christ. What is it? Let me ask you this. What is it that gave John such a head start in life? Friend, I want you to listen real carefully. And parents, grandparents, listen carefully as well. John had a head start in life because of his parents. Listen to Luke chapter 1, verse 6. Of Zacharias and Mary, it is said, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the statutes and commandments of the Lord, blameless. And so as we think about John, what made him such a great worker, what, what gave him such a head start in life. John was a head and shoulders above others in some ways because his parents really lived and taught what they believed. Friends, as we think about the work of parents today and the good that can be done, think about Timothy. His mother and grandmother taught him the Holy Scriptures from childhood. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. As parents train their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6 verses 1 through 4, as they teach them the way of God from the earliest days, Deuteronomy 6 verses 6 through 10, look at the, the good and the impact that can have on our children, giving them a, a head start in righteousness and doing the things that God wants them to do. Let's then make a second practical application from the life of John. John taught a baptism that was similar but not the same as the baptism of Jesus. John's baptism, according to Matthew 3 or Luke 3 verse 3, was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, meaning that for one to be baptized, they had to repent. Remember, certain people came out to be baptized by John, and John said, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. And so it was a baptism that was that went ahead of it before that baptism preceded by repentance. And so one had to change his life before he could be baptized, but it was also a baptism for the remission of sins. Those who followed John's baptism and died in that state would have been forgiven of their sins. When Christ comes on the scene, do we see that they've got to be baptized into Christ? Sure they do. Acts 18 and 19 clearly teaches that. But it was unique and a lot like the baptism of our Lord and Savior. In this baptism, people of John's, people acknowledged their sins and recognized need for the Savior. Matthew 3 verses 5 and 6, they came to John confessing that they were in sin and in need of salvation. Friend, for a person to be saved and to obey the gospel, must that person realize and come to the recognition he's in sin? Well, it's something we'll all have to do. Do you remember Romans 3 verse 23? The scripture says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so as we think about John's work and what he did in his baptism, it's a lot like Christ. Uh, John baptized Christ himself. Matthew 3 verse 15, Jesus came to John to be baptized. And you remember John's response. John said, you've come to me to be baptized. I need to be baptized by you. Jesus said, permit it to be so to fulfill all righteousness. Now, here's an interesting passage. I want you to notice this one. Look in Luke chapter 7, and there's often a passage that we overlook, I think, concerning the idea of baptism that we learn about in Luke's account concerning John's baptism. Luke chapter 7, I want you to notice verses 28 and 29. The scripture records, John speaking, for I say to you, or Jesus speaking, for I say to you, among those born of woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. Now notice verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized. What do we learn here about baptism? Here's what we learn. A failure to be baptized the way the Bible teaches is an out-and-out -out rejection of God Himself. You cannot say, I believe in God, I'm a Christian, I've never been baptized. Those two don't go hand in hand. 
a failure to be baptized is a rejection of God Himself. Now, we do know that John's baptism was not the final and ultimate baptism. Acts 19, we find certain people, they come on the scene and they're asked, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you're baptized? And their response basically is, Holy Spirit, what's that? We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Whose baptism were you baptized in? John's. They took them and baptized them into Christ. Jesus' baptism is unique in that John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Christ's baptism was not preparatory, didn't get people ready. It puts them in. The kingdom of God is for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38, and is how one contacts the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, another reason we often look up to John in the Bible is that John wasn't afraid to speak the truth even in difficult situations. Do you remember Mark chapter 6? Here we have Herod and his wife, Philip uh, as well, mentioned in the context. And John is now going to preach to them about the truth. And he's going to speak about their marriage and how that it is not according to the will of God. And John although he knows this man has the power to take his life, says, it's not lawful for you to have her. John wasn't afraid to speak on difficult situations like marriage, divorce, and remarriage. The Bible clearly says there's only one scriptural reason for divorce, and that's fornication, Matthew 19, 9. John wasn't afraid to say, you're living in an unscriptural relationship that is not right in the sight of God. Friend, we need the courage like John to boldly speak out on what God says concerning His truth and His will for the home, for the family, for our nation, whatever it may be. If we're going to be like John, we've got to preach the whole counsel of God. Acts 20 verse 28. We've got to preach the truth in love. Ephesians 4 verse 15. We've got to preach the Word. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. And we've got to speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 11. You know what's amazing about John is John stands out as a wonderful hero because he was willing to give his life for the cause of Christ. He knew his purpose in coming was to prepare the way. Christ is now on the scene. He isn't afraid to give his life since his mission has been completed. When he told that ruler in Mark chapter 6, it's not lawful for you to have her, the wife then goes and asks for the head from her daughter. The daughter asks for the head of John the Baptist. The mother tells the daughter that in Mark chapter 6. And John loses his life for the cause of Christ. Friend, are we committed like John was? Do we really believe? Revelation 2 verse 10. Be faithful until death. I'll give you the crown of life. Can we say as Paul did? I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. You know, one of the great things about John as we think more about practical lessons from his life is John wanted to get out of the way and point others to Jesus. John 1 verse 27, he was even worthy, he said, to loose the sandals from Jesus' feet. John 3 verse 30, he would say, he must increase, I must decrease. He was wanting people to see Christ through him. He didn't want to be out in front. He wanted to push Jesus to the forefront. Friend, in our life as we live, how we desperately need that same mentality. What is it we want in this life? I want people to see Christ living in me, the hope of glory. We want to let our light shine so that others can see Christ living in us. Matthew 5, verse 16. We want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, 1 Peter 2, 21. We want to imitate Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. And when people look at us, we want them to realize they've been with Jesus and we want to direct them to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, as we think about John and as we kind of wind things up regarding him, John wasn't more worried about suffering than he was about preaching the truth. Regardless of the issue, John was willing to say what God said. Let me give you an example. Certain of the religious elite, 
Everybody's doing it, and so certain of the religious elite come out to be baptized by John. John spoke as clearly as he's ever spoken when he said, You brood of vipers, current language we might say, you bunch of snakes, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Don't say to yourself, we've got Abraham as our father, John will say. Jesus will say as well. And so here are people who are trusting in self, trusting in their heritage, and they want to do it because, hey, it's popular and everybody's doing it. John said, no, that's not the way it works. You need to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Friend, if there is a, a very practical lesson that we learn from John, from his work, from his teaching, from his life, it is that God wants us to prepare our hearts so that in obedience to the gospel, we can enter into the kingdom and truly live a life of sacrifice for our God. As we think about John today, we ask you kindly, and yet we ask you with a sense of soberness and reality, are you really ready for that day when the Lord does return to claim His own? Are you prepared right now spiritually so that your life can glorify God every day? Have you become a Christian? Not asking have you become a part of a denominational group. We're asking have you become a Christian. Remember Acts 11 verse 26, they were simply called Christians first in Antioch. Well, what does one do to become a Christian? The Bible teaches you've got to hear the Word. Are you willing to listen to this book and this book alone? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Once you've heard that message, are you willing to believe in Jesus? Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. John chapter 8, verse 24. Would you be willing to repent, change your life, and turn to God? Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would you make the great confession, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? With the heart, one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, verse 10. And would you do what Jesus said? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, if you've not done those things, we encourage you to. And as, as Christians, as parents, as members of the Lord's body, let's have the same zeal as John and let's point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit us at thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com, call us at 580-798-7656, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.